Her name is Ivan Alfred Holshausen, and it's spelt H-O-L-S-H-A-U-S-E-N. The origin is German. My great-grandfather came to South Africa in 1854. Mm. Uh, he was uh, part of the British-German legion that the Brits uh, recruited to fight in the Crimean War. But uh, while, they, while they were training in the UK in, the, in, <clears throat> in 1853, the, uh, 1854, the uh, Crimean War came to an end. And they gave the, the, the uh, people the choice of either going back to Germany, coming to South Africa, or going to India. My great-grandfather chose to come to South Africa, so he came arrived in 1854. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Johannesburg. And when was... 1930. What, what is your birthday? 28th of March, 1930. So 28th of March of 1920? 1930. 1930. Yeah. So you are now... 88. 88. You look great, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lucky. <laughs> very lucky. And your voice is very strong. And you sit and up and down so quickly. Yeah, I'm one of the fortunate people that... So, anyway, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about the schools that you went through you, when you were growing up. What school and where did you go? And well, I mean, I went through three schools, obviously, uh, because I was to junior schools <clears throat> and then another uh, junior school after that, all in Johannesburg. And then I went to the high school, in, in Jeppe High School in Johannesburg. What is the name of school? Jeppe High School. J-P? Jeppe, J-E-P-P-E. J-P-P-E. And it's one of the top high schools in Johannesburg oh, even today. Right? Uh -huh. mm. So you went very good school? Yeah, it was, it's a government school, it's not a private school. But in those days, I mean, uh, uh, as I say, it was one of the uh, top schools in, in South Africa. So when did you graduate that school? Uh, that was, uh, 1940. 19 must have been 1945, 40, 47. I should have been. 47. Yeah. And uh, let me ask this question. Did you know anything about Korea at the time that you were graduating from high school? No, not at high school. No, because I mean th those days uh, in 47, th in the 40s. I mean the, the war just finished. And there was very little known in this country about uh, Korea. Obviously, the main, main uh, scene in the Far East was uh, Burma, uh, India, and uh, Japan, obviously. So you learn about Burma and Japan from the school? Well, we learned about that. And also, been the news in those days was all about the war in those countries. Mm. So, I mean, we, we picked up a lot of stuff from all the Far East uh, from the news because of the war. But, but you didn't know much about Korea? Well, in those days, I mean, it was, uh, Korea didn't really enter too much into the, the scene in South Africa, especially. Uh -huh. And I don't think too much in the world. Uh, I mean, that, uh, as I found in uh, 1952, I went there, in, I've got there in the beginning of December 1952. And I, I left there on the 20th of October 1953. And I mean, uh, uh, those days, uh, Korea was a third world country. I mean, it had been under Japanese rule for so many years. No, and, no, 40, 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, it had, had all a, a lot of bad history before that. So and it, was a, it was a country that, uh, that I found to be uh, uh, basically uh, uh, Farming country, mm. agrarian yeah. people, very, very little, little industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, Seoul, uh, I remember Seoul, all right, the war had gone through Seoul three times, but even so, I mean, that didn't, uh, didn't do, that, do that much. But I mean, Seoul in those days was a small city. It was a very small city. And I mean, uh, you know, it, it, <clears throat> to my knowledge, I, 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 I think there used to be two bridges. I only remember the one bridge. It used to take the road and the rail traffic. 
uh, and uh, when I go back, uh, when I went back in 2000, I mean at that stage of the game there were either 22 or 24 bridges across <laughs> the Hahn. And I mean when I go back now there's even more, because I know in 2000 they said to us they were already uh, planning another four bridges at that stage of the game. So I don't know how many there are now, because nobody could answer that question for me. So you went back to Korea in 2000? 2000, yes. What about the latest one? Did you go back to Korea last year? No, no, went back. We only got back a month ago. Month ago? Yes, we, went, we only got back on the... So how, how many times have you been back to Korea twice. since twice? So 2000 and one month ago in now, 2018. Got back, we got back on the 5th of October. So tell me about it. What is the change? I'm not talking about the, the differences between 1953 and 2000, but... 2000 and month ago, do you see the difference? Oh yes, I mean yes, there's been a, a, a tremendous amount. Look, our, our travel was limited this time in Seoul and up to the uh, DMZ, okay, uh, to the tunnels at, uh, uh, what's the name of, the, whatever the name of the place the tunnels are. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I mean, uh, I, I find that uh, there's been a, 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 a big change up there, or not as much as, bef as when we found in 2000. But I mean, now there was still a big change up there with a vast uh, amount of uh, construction, living construction, of, uh, of uh, high-rise uh, buildings for people to live in. Uh, we saw that when we were flying over Korea, uh, over, the, over the cities that you flew over, and we saw it in Seoul itself. And... Uh, uh, which, was, uh, which was also a, a big difference to what, uh, to what I found there in 2000. Um, obviously, the what had started, but I mean, now there was, it was a tremendous difference. And I also found uh, uh, roads and things like that uh, had also developed. A lot of the stuff uh, which rather surprised me this time, which I don't remember from 2000. It must have been there. That was started, but I don't honestly remember it. But this time, what also uh, surprised me was the, the high-level roads uh, in Seoul and outside of Seoul, uh, uh, which are uh, which, uh, great. I've been, as I said before, I've been, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, your Korean people are absolutely unbelievable. Really, they, they are. You know, when I look back on the whole scene, it's... Uh, even this 18 years, is, it's absolutely unbelievable what you people have achieved and what you've done. Look, from what I can make out, it has cost you. Because I was speaking to, on this trip now, you probably know, we had carers. And some of the young guys that we had, and some of the young girls, uh, most of them were university students. And speaking to, the, to them, I asked them a lot of questions. They mm. wanted to know questions also. But we asked them a lot of questions about this whole scene. And from what I could make out, uh, you haven't got away for free for what you have developed. It has cost the Korean nation a lot. Uh, from what I can make out, one of the things that it has cost the nation is, this is what, this is what I was told, and this is just one of the things, but it's a major thing, was that people, because of the, the stress and what have you that, that you people have been under since 53, uh, you have come up with uh, uh, drugs and alcoholism in the country. Uh, people, this is what I've been told, that uh, people have now had to, with all the stress that's taken over the years, it's gradually come more and more drugs and alcoholism has come into the country. I don't know if it's right or not, that's what I was told. From to me, Korea? Yeah. Drug and alcoholism? Drug and alcoholism. That's what I was told by these university guys, that this is what they, ha what they see. You mean the Korean university guy told you that? Yes. Ah, we are mostly drug-free country there. Korea is, has no much serious problem oh. of drugs. I mean, people drink alcohol and we consume a lot of soju. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least, at least... But we don't have a drug problem. Let me go back to the points that you are making. You made an excellent point about the differences that Korean people were able to make. Um, but what 
where did you land for the first time in Korea in 1953? When was it and where did you land? Uh, the first time we landed in Korea was uh, in uh, at K10. K10, Jinhae. Which was way down in the south. Yeah. It was, uh, it was our, it was that time it was the uh, Cheetah Squadron's rear base. Because we operated out of K10 and K46. Hwang Song. Yeah. How it was? Uh, yeah, I think it was K ten. I think. I, I think. I, I no, K ten is in the south. K forty six up, up there. In the north. Yeah. Okay, so it was K ten that we landed at uh, to start with, and I mean, uh, only, we were only there for uh, for a couple of weeks uh, because uh, I was part of the first South African group uh, that uh, uh, knew that the government here knew that. The squadrons and the 18th fighter bomber wing were going to change over to jets, but they didn't know exactly when. <clears throat> so, uh, you know how the uh, the uh, squ uh, pilots on the squadron are staggered, so that people go home not at all at the same time. Okay. But before you go into the detail, I want to talk about what was your first impression of Korean village or city? What did you see there, and can you describe in detail? Just like you are watching it, what you are landing in K10, and look around the cities there. What was your image? Well, look, we didn't see very much because, I mean, well, first... Uh, but after you landed and then you were able to see, what did you see? Well, I mean, K K10 was just an airbase. And, uh, I mean, the, the main thing there, when we landed there, it was snowing and it was cold. Nah. <laughs> In those days, though, being young, you didn't, you didn't worry about the cold. Mm. But I mean, it was snowing. And K-10 was a, a basic air base. It, uh, it wasn't a very big air base. So, you know, and it was, everything was so new to us. So we didn't take too much in at that stage of the game. And also, uh, for the, 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 the coming weeks, we never left, left the air base at all, except mm. to fly. Mm. Because we... Uh, had it, we started off on our conversion onto the Mustang. And so we were busy with the Mustang conversion. And then I think it was the day after Christmas, uh, we got the, because we hadn't started operations yet. But I think it was the day after Christmas when we got the message that that was the last day of Mustang operations. When did you land in Chinhe? Uh Let's see now, I left. I left Joburg in on the sixth of December, mm -hmm. so it, I had uh, uh, four days, five days, six days. It must have taken about. I must have landed there probably about the twelfth of December, because we were held up in Rome for three days, because uh, all the aircraft were uh, snowbound in in the UK, because we were flying Boeing in those days from Rome to Japan. But what kind of aircraft did you train yourself when you were in South Africa, when you joined the uh, Air Force? What kind of aircraft were you trained? Well, I'd already, I'd already started flying. I already had my civil license. And uh, so, but what, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll just explain to you what happened with me and how I, got, how I joined the Air Force. Exactly. Okay, I, I, was, I was always interested in flying. Uh -huh. So when I left school, I started work. I never went to university. I started work. What kind of work? Oh, I was in the stores. I was a, store, a clerk in the, in the stores of a, in a big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, company that sold uh, corrugated iron, all these, that sort of things, and what have you. Anyway, I was in the stores. <clears throat> and with earning money and what have you, and my, my, my parents helped me as well, I, I decided to start flying. So I started flying civilly. And... Uh, uh, I got my civil license, and the, uh, it was the Johannesburg Light Playing Club, which was at Baraguanath, a uh, 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 private airfield outside of Johannesburg. And the, it was a big uh, uh, club, private club, and the, the manager of the club was an ex-South African Air Force colonel. He was actually the youngest colonel in the South African Air Force during the war. He was an absolutely super guy. And after I'd been flying at uh, Baraguanath for about six or eight months, he came to me, because at Baraguanath, uh, in those days, I can't remember the name of it, Dirk might know, uh, 
in the, in the main big cities in, in South Africa, you could do, you could apply to join the South African Air Force and do your, uh, uh, what do you call it, the civil, what do you call it, call up? Yeah, you do national service. National service. Uh, and uh, during the day, uh, over a period of time, you could still work. But I used to, and so, you know, at just in the main cities, they had these. And at the, at, like at Johannesburg Light Playing Club, uh, you started on, on Tiger Moss. Uh, this is on the Air Force I'm talking about. You did 50 hours on Tiger Moss. Then you went, uh, that took about six months, or maybe not as much. Then you went to Central Flying School and you converted on to Harvard's. And then did the rest of your period on Harvard's. You had a month at Central Flying School, then you went back. And what used to happen was that we used to fly in the mornings before work. I used to, um, <clears throat> that four, three or four mornings a, a week, I used to go, and not only me, but all the other guys too, used to go and fly. We used to take off at six o'clock in the morning and uh, fly and then go to work. And after work, we'd go back to JRPC uh, and uh, go to lectures and what have you. And we would spend every, every Saturday there flying as well. So when did you officially join the Air Force and what was your rank? Well, my rank was a pupil pilot. Pupil pilot. That's when I first started, yes. Yeah. And that was in, that was in uh, September, uh, September 19, uh, 1950. September, beginning of nine, September 1950, because my course was 350. Mm. And, uh, and that's the time that Korean War broke out. The Korean War just started. Yeah. Yes. So, just, did you think that you'd go to Korea? Well, at that stage, the game. Uh, what had happened in South Africa was the permanent force people. Uh, they they were used because nobody knew how long this war was going to last. So, the permanent force pilots were all ex uh, ex wartime people uh, from the World War. They all had to go first of all. Okay. And then, as the time went on, uh, obviously they started running out of out of ideas. Right. So then they started looking for people mm -hmm. uh, that had joined on the on the national service. So uh, then they asked us, uh, as we as we got our wings, uh, before you got your wings, the last time you were at Central Fly School, on your wings course, they asked you who would like to go to Korea, and you volunteered. You see, because in those days. Uh, uh, there was a law in South Africa that uh, you, you couldn't be sent out of South Africa unless you volunteered. Mm -hmm. so the government couldn't send you out of the, out of, outside. <clears throat> so you had to volunteer. I and see. And that's when uh, <clears throat> 11 of us uh, 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 got our wings on my course. <clears throat> and I think, about, uh, I think about five of us volunteered to go to Korea. But I mean, there were a couple of courses ahead of us. Uh, guys uh, like Al Ray and what have you, they... I had all gone to Korea before me because... Uh, that Were you not afraid that you are going to a war? Oh, I was young. It was, it was, <laughs> look, it was, a, it was an adventure. Uh, I, was not, I was not politically uh, minded in those days, but I didn't like communism. Communism to me was something that was, was not on. But I wasn't... Uh, how did you come to know about the communism? Well, I mean, during the war, I mean, it was all tied in with, uh, with uh, communism in China, communism in Russia, and all these sort of things. And to me, it, 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 just, it just wasn't on, because it didn't make sense. Uh, living, in, living in Africa, uh, especially, uh, it, just, it just didn't make sense. I see. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, so that's that was one of the things. But I mean, uh, that wasn't that was part, a very small part of the motivating scene. But I also wanted to fly. Mm. And so when you left for Korea, what was your rank and what was your unit? I was a second lieutenant because when you got your wings, you promoted to second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And your two squadron. Two squadron, yes, yeah. two squadron, yeah. So you. You were just about to tell me about the transition from Mustang to Sabre, right? Yes. Have you ever flew the Mustang? Well, what happened was that when the government here knew that the 18th fighter bomber were going to change to, to jets, what they did was they now trained up uh, a, a bunch of guys. And, uh, 
and what we did, we were the first ones to do it, uh, because in the early days, with the people flying Mustangs in Korea, uh, when you trained here, when you did your operational training course in South Africa, you flew, you, uh, you threw Spitfires, yeah. which was obviously the uh, same Mustang. So with us, not knowing what, what, when the date was going to change, we did our complete course on Spitfires, and then we had a, a week's leave, and then we went back and did a complete course on vampires, because the South, South African Air Force only recently got vampires. And at that stage of the game, uh, at Lagerbahn, where we did our, uh, we had one, one vampire trainer, one of the very early vampire trainers, which was a real death trap. Mm. <laughs> because they had those ejection seats and a little canopy on the top that only one could get through if you pushed yourself through with two people in it. Was, anyway, we only had the one. So you did, you did about one hour or maybe two hours at the most on this trainer uh, and then uh, you went off on your solo, on your solo vampires. So we had done a, a Spitfire course and then we did a complete jet course on the vampires. Where? In South at, Africa? At Longabon, at, yeah, at Longabon in South Africa, down in the, in the Cape. So you were ready to ride, I um, mean, the flu fly Jets. jet. Huh. So when we arrived in Korea, we, as I said, we were still on Mustangs up until the end of, uh, up until whatever it was, the 26th of, of December. Then they stopped us. Okay, that was finished. So I did, I did about, uh, I forget, about 10 hours or something on Mustangs. And then uh, they said, okay, we'll get all the Mustangs ready, serviceable, because on the, on the 31st of December, a whole lot. We're taking the whole lot back to Japan and uh, uh, giving them back to the USAF. So on the 31st of December, uh, we took the whole lot back. And that was the first time since 1950 that the whole squadron, uh, pilots I'm talking about, had been in Japan uh, together. So, and so we spent the 31st of December... 1952. Two. So, yeah, so then... Uh, how did you actually, how many times did you train for F-86 before you actually uh, launch an official sortie? Well, the point was that uh, we left, uh, we only spent, we spent the night of the 31st in Tokyo. Yeah. On the 1st of January 1953, we flew back to the new airbase, K-55, OSAN, and uh, the base wasn't even complete yet. Hmm. The American engineers were still operating there, working, and we were the first. Uh, we were the first uh, squadron to get there. We got there before even the Americans of 18 fighter bomber wing, mm. but uh, uh, it, there was there were no aircraft there, so we had to wait, and then the American squadron started coming in, and but what happened was that uh, with us having flown vampires back in South Africa. The government here, the Air Force, decided that it wasn't worthwhile the chap, the guys that were there, that hadn't, they'd never flown jets. So they kept a couple of the top guys there. They kept about four, five guys, I can't remember the exact number. They kept about five of the top people, and the rest, regardless if they'd done one operation or if they'd done 75, they sent them home. Because they said it's not, not worth their time training on jets in, Japan, in, in Korea. So they all went home. Of course, we as a, as, a, as a group, we were the first big group since 1950 to go over to Korea as a, because we'd all trained on, on vampires. So we had a big group go over to Korea ready to take over the jets. So how, how many, where did you train yourself with the F-86? At K-55 when they started Osa. coming in. Because the, at OSAN, because the Americans also sent a, a traveling group of... Uh, of uh, people around with all their all their equipment, and we had a ten day ground course on the on the F eighty six. Ten day, at, 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 ten at, day. At and days. who trained you? Did you train yourself? Well, what happened was that uh, just to get us uh, au fait with the uh, American uh, jet uh, uh, instrument flying and the letdowns in bad weather. They, they they gave us uh, one T thirty three with an American instructor, and each of us uh, did about an hour with the instructor on the T thirty three. Only one hour. One hour, uh, and then uh, I mean the, the, the same as a, a single single seater. Right. The same as Vampire, same as Spitfire, same mm -hmm. as a Mustang. 
So, I mean, we had flown jets. That's why they sent all the other guys home that hadn't flown jets. So, didn't, wasn't it difficult for you to, no. to fly F-86? No. Not at all? F-86 is an easy airplane to fly. Huh? Uh, did you know that South... Who pays for the aircraft? Did, did, did South, Korean, South African government pay for it? South African government paid for the lot. Do you have any knowledge about how much it's been paid for, for that aircraft? Yes. Uh, I saw it recently. I, I can't remember. But I know it cost... Eventually it cost the South African government uh, total, uh, total. Of, of, of all the aircraft and what have you. Uh, the figure that I remember came to nearly four million pounds in those days. Four million. Which was a lot of money. I thought that American government provided aircraft. No, no, the South African, air, South African government paid. What, did, what happened was we paid the American government for every aircraft that we lost. Wow. They lent them to us, but we paid them for every aircraft that we lost. Oh, we paid, so you didn't pay all the aircraft from the beginning, but you had to pay for the aircraft that has been lost. Yes, I can't remember how, how it came in, but I know it came to, I know it, the figure, I know it, it actually, uh, it was an enormous figure in those days, four million pounds, uh -huh. and what have you. How many F-86 were there for the South African Squadron 2? Two had, squadron. Uh, I think we had about 16. 16? Yeah, of course. And how many pilots for the F-86 from South Africa? Well, initially, the ones that, by course, we had 16 pilots that went over. 16. Over initially, and then uh, a couple of, uh, after a while, uh, after some months, uh, well, that, the rest of the guys went home, except for about four, about, as I say, five or six. So there were about 20, say about 20, 21 pilots there at that stage of the game. And uh, uh, then we were there as a bunch. No new pilots came in for for a long time, until we, after we have been in operations for, for quite some time before new pilots came in. As a veteran uh, pilot of South Africa, two squadron, very famous, can you compare the, the functions, the performance of Mustang and Sabre? Uh, you, can you give us some sort of competitive... Uh, how do you mean? I'm not... What? Sabre versus Mustang. Which one is better, and in terms of what? Oh, look, the Sabre was uh, uh, was far, far better than the Mustang. Uh, also, I mean, basically, uh, starting from the beginning, the Mustangs were old. They were ex-World War stuff. They'd been flown in, the, in, in America by the national uh, people over there over the years. So they were old. And uh, uh, also being... Uh, uh, a complex uh, piston, uh, piston engine air aircraft. They, uh, I mean, they not, they're not reliable as a jet. Mm -hmm. Also, the F-86s that we got were the, the very latest out of America. They were F-86Fs, mm. and uh, they were brand new. They were out the box. Nobody, they, except for their test flights, they'd never been flown. So you like the F-86? Yeah, but I mean, they, they were, uh, the jets, uh, look, a jet is far, far better than the piston mm -hmm. engine aircraft. I see. Uh, from reliability, there's no two ways about it. I mean, also, they, they were far, far better. Uh, we did a lot of different work. And also, the Americans, because uh, uh, this was the first time that uh, any, any of the high-speed jets had ever done any fighter-bomber stuff. So the Americans were also learning. I mean, they they had used the uh, F-80s and what have you on fighter bomber stuff a little bit, but when that when they started when the 18th fighter bomber wing started using the F-86s as fighter bombers, the Americans realised then that uh, uh, that they were actually misusing them to a large extent, because uh, we used to do a lot of, when we first started. We used to do a lot of close support work with the army. And what have you? Yeah, so tell me about what kind of uh, work did you do? I mean, what was your mission or a daily routine? Tell me about those, well, please. Let me just go through the missions to start with. Okay, when we started, I mean, it was all fighter bomber stuff. So it was all pre-brief stuff, except for the uh, close support work. Uh, so what do you mean by supporting? Well, that's working with uh, the troops in the front line. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're working right down to maybe 100 meters of people in the front line where they are having a major problem 
and they need air support to help them get out of their problems. Mm -hmm. So we, we started off doing that, not all the time, but when they, when they called us. But then you used to always work under a mosquito, which, which was a Harvard. The guy used to have smoke rockets. Mm. And uh, he used to uh, work in conjunction with an air, air controller on the ground, and he would put in a smoke rocket, and then he would direct the, the sabers uh, from the smoke rocket. He would say, go... 500 meters uh, east or whatever. So whatever you called that mosquito? Well, that, that was, uh, it was a waste of, a, a waste of sabers, uh, quite honestly. A uh, uh, piston-engine aircraft were far better on that than the sabers. And uh, so after, after a while, uh, they, they decided, the American Air Force decided that uh, they stopped that. Also, we, start, we also started with, uh, uh, like the Mustangs used to do, with... Uh, uh, what are the not fa what are the, what are the Air Force called Fantans Dirk? Um, the incendiary uh, dropping those the incendiary tanks, you know, dropping that, that burst of incendiary. Uh, the, the, the missile called uh, napalm. Napalm, yeah. Look, I'm just getting mixed up because I always also do them as Fantan, but napalm. We, we started off with napalm, and. Uh, uh, after a, a sh very short time, uh, you see, with, with a napalm, uh, used to have to come in and drop them at somewhere around about 100, 100 feet to 50 feet, and you'd have to slow down to about 250 knots, because otherwise when the napalm hit the ground, the uh, fuses would come out, they wouldn't ignite. So you had to slow right down, and you were, you were very, very vulnerable to ground fire. Anyways, and I was actually on the last mission of where the Sabres did napalm. Uh, 20, 20 of us went out on a napalm uh, drop on a, on a, 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 big, uh, a big base, uh, army, uh, well, Chinese, North Korean base, and uh, 20 of us went out. The first uh, 16 were all Americans from 18th Fighter Bomber. The last four were, were the two squadron and I was number four. So I was the 20th aircraft that went into drop. And when we got back, uh, uh, five, or six, five or six of the American aircraft had been hit, but none of the South African Air Force had, had, had been hit. Wonderful. Which, which was absolutely unreal. But I was the last uh, person in Korea in a Sabre to drop napalm. Mm. The American Air Force then said, no, no, no more. What kind of bomb was napalm? Explain it to the ch because the young children will listen to oh, this okay. interview. What kind of bomb was it? Okay, napalm was a, uh, a fuel tank, external fuel tank, filled with a mixture of fuel and something else to make a, a jelly, a highly uh, explosive incendiary jelly, with a f a fuses in the nose and the tail of, of, of the tank. So you had two, two of these tanks. They were normally somewhere around, I can't remember the exact scenes, somewhere around about 100, 120 gallon, American gallons, what have you. And you had to drop these. When they hit the ground, these tanks exploded, opened, the fuses burnt, and they set the mixture alight. And this whole lot went off in a wave of, uh, of th and if anything it, it touched, it stuck to. A person or, or vehicle or anything like that, and it stuck, you couldn't wipe it off. So you, you, it, uh, it was a, a terrible weapon. Terrible weapon, and that really us, scared the enemies. It scared the enemies, and uh, also uh, what happened was that if you were dropping napalm and you were shot down and you, went and you bailed out in that area where you dropped napalm, you weren't exactly the most popular person <laughs> uh, t to the Chinese or North Koreans at that stage of the game. Yeah. They, they didn't like you whatsoever. So, at the time when you were flying Sabre, were there any enemy aircrafts? And were they stronger than you, the UN forces? Tell me about what was the situation there at the enemy air force and us? Okay. Who, who, was, who were better? All right, let's put it this way. Uh, as a fighter bomber wing, we were doing mainly mainly uh, uh, fighter dropping bombs and uh, not rockets. We never rocketed. We did bombs and napalm. But then the napalm, as I say, stopped. And then 
Uh, but with our aircraft, we actually had our sabers were faster than the American fighter wings mm. because ours had updated engines and all that sort of thing. So we actually were faster than the fighter fighter wings that were flying sabers. The same saber, wings. same saber, but your saber was yeah, but we faster were, than U.S. Yeah, we had we were faster than them. How? Well, our, we had we had much more powerful engines, and we had different wings. Uh, the F eighty six F was a totally different airplane to to the E, uh -huh. because uh, it was the first uh, saber to have uh, hard points on the wings. When I say hard points on the wings, I'm talking about the wings were stressed, to and had the uh, setups underneath where you could put bomb racks on. You couldn't fit them to any of the other sabers. The wings wouldn't take them, and they didn't have the settings. Uh, and we also had so the wings were different. They were also. Uh, from what we were told, I could be wrong here, we were told that the wings were slightly different in shape as well. But also our engines were much more powerful than the F than the E's. So we were actually, I mean, I know this because uh, uh, one day I was on, uh, on a training flight mm. and I came across a, uh, an F-86E from one of the fighter wings and uh, we just decided to have a little bit of a tangle. And uh, I, I outflew him. Mm. I could outclimb him and outturn him. Uh, so there was that side of the scene. But what happened was that Americans, uh, they, their two fighter wings used to run out of ideas at times with aircraft. Because we used to, uh, we used to run the uh, Yala patrols and we used to run the Chong Chong patrols. And uh, so what happened, they, when they ran out of ideas, when they ran out of aircraft for their patrols, they used, the American Air Force used to uh, uh, put us onto the, onto the fighter patrols. And we used to go up and do the Yolo patrols and the Chong Chong patrols, all under radar, American radar. And uh, what happened was that uh, what we found, and what we were told at that stage of the game, that I mean, the majority of the MiG-15s, that was our opposition, were being flown either by the Chinese Air Force or the Russian Air Force. Very few Koreans. There were some, apparently, but it was mainly Chinese and, and Russian. And what we were told also, and it comes doesn't quite fit in because I've read two books, both from the Russian and the Chinese Air Force people, and but we were told that they generally worked on the basis of a six-week rotation of people coming out, doing a six-week uh, tour and then going off again. Uh, we found that... Uh, well, the MiGs could fly higher than us. Oh. We, we used to operate at about 45,000 feet. The MiGs were operating at about 50,000 feet. So uh, uh, the MiGs uh, always had the... Uh, the advantage, yeah. They could decide if they wanted to fight, if they didn't want to fight. We, we, on our Yalu patrols and the Chong Chong patrols, uh, you'd often see uh, MiGs go over the top of you. But the, all, I did 10 air to air, 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 air patrols there over that period. And in none of those did they ever, the MiGs ever come down to us. We couldn't go up to them, but they never came down to us. Why not? So I don't know why or whatever, but we were told that, that as the six weeks period went on, at the beginning they would start uh, where they would fly over you and watch to put the people that would fly, the new people, uh, get them... Uh, au fait with what was going on. But they could shoot down you because they were higher, right? They were able to well, see you and they well, had they, weapons. They were under radar control. Radar, their radar was watching us as well. Right. Yeah, our radar was watching them. And their watch, the radar was watching us. We were under radar control all the time. You we never had any dogfight with me? Sir? Did you have any... No. Have a dogfight? No, no, not at all. You and didn't encounter enemy. We just saw them. It was up to them to come down. We couldn't go to them. They had to decide if they wanted to fight. Exactly. So if they didn't want to fight, there was nothing we could do because we couldn't get up there. So what's going on? Well, yeah, why they didn't they fight? Down. Why didn't they fight? Well, as I say, we were told that it was a six-week cycle. That initially they'd, they'd, they'd not come down. Just in, uh, The new chaps, they'd say, right, this is what goes on. And as the period went on, then one or two, a, a pair would, would come down or, or what have you. Look, it wasn't all... This is just a, a summary of the whole scene. It didn't always happen like us reading these two books from the Chinese Air Force guys and from the Russian Air Force guys. But they used to come down 
when they wanted to. And as the period went on, it got, they came down more and more often. Okay, and then the whole, whole scene would start over again in the next period where they wouldn't come down for, for time and then the whole scene start over. Mm. The other side of the story there is just while we're talking about the Russians and the, Ch and the Chinese, I don't know how true it was, but we were told that all the very the heavy ek uh, in North Korea was uh, done by, by a Russian woman. I don't know. The other side of the story is that uh, what I found out from the uh, reading these books that they would, if if you ever got into, we were told this, and nobody ever told us this at all, that if you ever got into trouble with the MIGs, if you ever got into a fight and you got damaged or something like that, and you ought to break off, that you headed out to sea, because the MIGs would never go over the coast, they'd never follow out to sea. Why not? It was political. Oh. And they would, and they would never follow you. They would never follow you too close to the. To the uh, front line, all political. Huh. I didn't they, know anything about they, they that. I didn't want to be shot down and be found, to, because if, because as you well know, China and uh, and Russia said no, we we not we not we not involved. So when you encounter, just in case, encounter MiG fifteen, you just go to the sea and they're not going to follow you. They wouldn't follow you if if you if you if you if, if you were in trouble, if you had been in a fight. And you were you trouble. You'd, if you could, you'd, if you were close enough, head out to sea. And this is what this is what I picked up from the books, but nobody ever told us. Okay. That. So ha had you ever been shot by the anti-aircraft cannons? Have, been, have you ever been shot? Shot. Yeah. No. When you were in flying, there were enemy anti-aircraft oh. guns well, and look. And the, look. <laughs> the anti-aircraft fire in Korea was unbelievable. From people that I spoke to there, that were ex-wartime guys flying in Europe, they said a lot of the anti-aircraft stuff in Korea was far more than they'd ever seen in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I got involved once. Uh, in, in Tell me about it. Well, I mean, I got it. Uh, so you've been hit. What? You've been hit. No, never hit. It's, look, this is the luck of the draw when you fly. You just, it's, you tell me how it works, <laughs> because I can't tell you why it works this way. I mean, I shouldn't be sitting here right now if if uh, if I hadn't if I if I wasn't lucky because I think I've written in here about the one the one operation where uh, I mean the uh, when we were called out we were sitting on standby the one day and we were called out to go and American reconnaissance aircraft had picked up a train a freight train mm -hmm. to stick it out of a tunnel and these things you never saw mm. I mean you never saw. Trucks, you never saw any movement of anything like that on the ground during the day because they used to do everything at night. And the trains they used to put in the tunnels during the day, the same as the trucks and what have you. Uh, but this aircraft, American aircraft, picked up this, this train standing outside, half out the tunnel. So we were called out. Four of, two of us got off. The other, other, one went, uh, other pair went US on takeoff. So they, only two of us went off. I was number two in the flight. And... Uh, when, by the time we got to the area, the American aircraft had run out of fuel, so he had pushed off. So we, we, uh, sorry, 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 I got it wrong. He picked up a tank. He picked up a tank. Mm -hmm. But when we got to the area, he'd gone, and the tank had gone to ground and camouflaged itself, so we couldn't find anything. So we looked around, and we found this train sticking out this tunnel. And we decided, okay, that we would, uh, uh, this was like something that we'd never seen before that we had to take it, uh, attack this train. Now this train, uh, this train line was in a narrow valley, very narrow valley. So we bombed this train, both of us bombed it, we both hit it. And then we decided, like we were stupid, uh, there was a lot of flak, a tremendous amount of flak. And uh, it turned out that this was a flak trap. Do you know what a flak trap is? Yeah. They lay on, they lay, lay on a target and it was flak for Africa. Anyway, so we went in and he strafed us. He, my leader went in first, I went in second. And very low, very, very low. I mean, I was just above the height of the train and strafed. Oh. I was very low and I was moving, I tell you. I was doing over five You must be a very good pilot. Oh, well, not really. I mean, that was one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go in low because of the valley as well, you see. Right. And, but there was, there was I mean, it, it, there was... Well, the flak was absolutely unbelievable of all of all calibers. I mean, uh, well, well, anyway, just leave it like that. 
But uh, as, when I opened up with my guns, uh, my flaps, I was doing over 500 knots now, my flaps started coming out. And uh, low down, at that speed, this is quite something. Because uh, the, whole, the whole aircraft uh, flying characteristics change. Because flaps aren't even supposed to come down at those speeds, as you well know. And they were limited to about 250 knots. Anyway, so I had my hands full now flying this aeroplane. And uh, so I broke off and pushed off, off and what have you. And I think possibly this might have saved me. Uh, uh, put the gunners off. And I say because the flak was absolutely unbelievable. Mm. And uh, we got off, went off home. But my airspeed indicator with all the vibration had had uh, gone US, so I just formated on my leader and flew mm. home with him. But that was that. But flak in Korea, a lot of the targets there were absolutely unbelievable with the flak that these guys put up, uh, both uh, light stuff and heavy stuff. It, uh, there, was, there was certainly no shortage of, uh, of anti-aircraft fire in Korea, so a lot of the targets there. Uh, so when did you leave Korea? 20th of October 1953. 1953, October 25th. And so from December of 52 to October 53, if I ask you to pinpoint one most difficult thing during your stay in Korea, what would be? What was the most difficult thing during your stay there? Difficult? Yeah. You didn't have any difficulties? Not really, no. I had, uh, I had no aircraft problems. Uh, was I, it cold? Uh, sir? Was it cold? Oh, it was cold, but I was young. I mean, we were talking about this now. I mean, I feel the cold here and I feel the heat. In the, in the, up until a couple of years ago, I mean, cold and heat never meant a thing to me. <laughs> but these days it does. I mean, the coldest I ever remember there was uh, uh, one night, it, I mean, it used to go down, you know what it's like there. I mean, I remember my, uh, temperature of minus 36, uh, or what have you. I mean, at K55, we had, uh, the Americans had built the new bungalows. And uh, in each bungalow, we had two uh, uh, diesel uh, stoves operating. Yeah, I think those, I know that. Those little stoves. Yes, yes, yes. They were red hot in winter. Yeah. In the mornings when you got up, I mean, we lived, we slept on stretchers. And in the morning when you got up in the midwinter, uh, you used to have to stand on your stretcher because from about this height, waist height, mm -hmm. that, was, that was hot, that was cold. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Right, so you have uh, frozen hair here. <laughs> but it, it, as I say, the cold never worried us, it never worried me. But you had to be careful, you couldn't touch, touch uh, aircraft with your bare hands or anything, so take the skin straight off your hands. All the, the technicians had to all wear gloves in that cold weather, because uh, otherwise it, skin would come off the hands. So total, how many sorties did you finish? While you were there? I finished, I got the highest on Sabres, 75. 75? Yes, I, because when we, when we went on to Sabres, with us all being new except for a couple of people, they had to now stagger us. So they said to us, who wants to fly quickly and who wants to fly slowly? So I I'd, I'd got engaged before I left to go to Korea. So I said I want to fly quickly because I want to go home. Yeah. So I, I flew quickly. So that was, uh, it was just one of those things that I, I finished up getting 75 missions, which was the most on Sabres, in the South African Air Force I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the American Air Force. Okay. And I did one in the back seat of a Firefly off the British aircraft carrier, the HMS Ocean. Because on the way from Rome to Tokyo, I got very friendly <coughs> Because uh, as you probably know, may know, we used to night stop in those days. You never flew overnight. So I got very friendly also talking to uh, a guy much, quite a lot older than myself, but he was in civvies. And we used to chat during the day, the couple of days that we were flying. And uh, I never, and then Hong Kong, we night stopped in Hong Kong. The next morning when we arrived at the airport, because we stopped at two different hotels. When we arrived at the airport, he stayed in a different hotel to me. And there's this chap standing there now in a British naval officer's uniform 
with four bars. He was a relieving captain going out to take over the HMS Ocean. And I mean, uh, he never told me that he was in the Navy or anything like that. So this was absolute uh, news to me. What, suddenly, finally, I was, ta- <laughs> I was talking to a naval captain. <laughs> so you've been flying with him once? Well, he said to me then, he said, look, when you, when you got organised and when I'm organised, just organise through our liaisons to come out and spend some time on the carrier. So I, 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 the first opportunity I got, and he said, you must bring a, 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 a friend with you. I, it was June in 1953, and we organised, and uh, we were flown out to the carrier that was operating in the Yellow Sea. And the, we spent a week on the carrier, and the one night we were standing in the, uh, in the wardroom, and all these young naval uh, uh, pilots uh, we were all talking, and they said to me, or said to myself and Len Wilmont, my, my pal, they said, how would you like to do a mission with us? And we said, okay, fine, no problem. So they said, fine. When they went, when they went to, to, to organise this, the captain said to them, whoa, we must get permission, if, uh, first of all. So they had to get permission from our liaison in Tokyo. And uh, Colonel de Toy, he came back and he said, if they want to fly, let them fly. So that's how you fly with it. So them. we flew on the back seat of a, of a fire okay. fly mm-hmm. on a bombing and staffing mission. Uh, so, it, so I actually got I actually got seventy six missions in. <laughs> and I, the, 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 funny enough, the, the the what came out of this lot was after I came back here, I spent I spent another uh, what five four and, four and a half years in the air force here on short service. Y- y- but let me ask this question. When you, do you know that Korea's economy now 11th largest in the world? Korean economy? Yeah. 11th largest in the world. Oh, I know. You oh, know that? Yes. And Korea is one of the most democratic society there in East Asia. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But when you left Korea in October of 1953, had you ever imagined that Korea would become like this? Why do you shake your... Why? No, never, ever. I mean, Korea was a third-rate third, third nation. It was nothing. There was nothing there. I mean, as I told you, you know, uh, Seoul was a small city. There was nothing there. I'll show you. I've got a photograph here. You took I the... think of, of a station. I'm not sure. You can tell me. I saw the station there now, the new station, but I never saw the old station. But I, I have an idea. It might have been the old station, but it's just, a, it's just walls. And I mean, and the Seoul, most of the, a lot of the buildings in Seoul were like that. And also, there was no high-rise buildings in Seoul in those days. It is, uh, yeah. So you very. I mean, from what I remember, there were three, maybe three or four-story buildings. I don't remember anything higher than that. I could be wrong, but uh, and also, I mean, the towns that you went to. Uh, I mean, I driving up to up to Seoul through one town or these places like that. Uh, uh, I mean, they were nothing. You know, there were old, old, uh, small, old cities. There was virtually nothing there. I mean, today, and in 2000 when we went there, I mean, it was, today it's a, it's a huge modern country. I mean, eight-lane highways through Seoul, and six-lane, six lane, eight, eight-lane highways out in the country, and all this sort of thing. And what struck us again, what struck us, my, my late wife and myself, and, what, and with Trish now, when we went there, was the... The, uh, the mentality and the, the, the way people live in Korea compared to us here. I mean, uh, everything there is, is spotlessly clean. You. you people are absolutely spotlessly clean. Mm. Uh, everything. You never see a piece of paper, you never see a piece of plastic, never anything lying around. The last time, we, in 2000, we, I went on the Underground Railway we went to go and have a look at the Olympic Village. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, getting on the trains and, and looking at the underground railway stations, looking down into the railway, onto the lines, in between all the, it was, uh, the ballast and the lines and that, absolutely spotless. Not like here, where everything has is, 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 is got rubbish lying around and what have you. The people are absolutely spotless over there. The roads, I looked for all these things when I was there now. The roads. I never ever saw, in all the roads, the time that we were there, I never saw one pothole. I don't know about when you were there. So what do you think that we may, were able to 
achieve such economic development? What do you think? Of course, you've got a work ethic, sir. that's huh? why. Mm. You people are frightened of work. And you want, you, you want to work and what have you, and you want to do things. Where in Africa, it doesn't work that way. It's the opposite. Uh, it's just the complete opposite. Because, because of the old tribal system here, don't forget. It's, uh, it's, and it's going to take a long, long time for that tribal system to, to change in Africa. I'm talking Africa now, not, not Korea. Hmm. But this, you asked me for the comparison. Uh, this whole lot goes backwards. Don't forget the old tribal system. The women used to do most of the work in the fields. The men used to sit and drink beer. And that hasn't changed much. I mean, there are, obviously, obviously there are uh, a lot of that doesn't apply to everybody. But to, to a large degree, it does. But let me ask this question. Despite such a beautiful outcome came out of your honorable service in the Korean War, you never thought that Korea would become like this today, and now it's 11th, and it's going to be seventh largest economy in the world by 2030. Is so so? We, we'll be ahead of France. Yeah. We're going to be stronger than France. Why we don't teach about this Korean War in, in South Africa and any other countries? Why we don't teach about it? It's a, it's a funny why, story. Why is it has to be a forgotten war? I've often wondered about that myself. And I can't you do, wonder, right? And I can't answer your question. Okay. I mean, you... You, you know, are the most honest Korean <laughs> war veteran from South Africa. <laughs> you see, like in South Africa now, the only scene I can think of in South Africa is why it hasn't happened here, was that there were so few people, South Africans, involved. Look... In, the, in the, the whole of the Korean War, you should know, there were only, what, 806, I think? 800? 826. 826 You're cheating. You are cheating. <laughs> only 826 South Africans went to Korea. Mm -hmm. That's the total. There were, there were the Air Force and, and a few of the Army people yes. that went over there. And that's it. And, and you take 826 people out of, out of South Africa, and the population. Ah. They were not, you know, there were so few of the population were involved. I mean, a lot of the, you talk a lot of these days to, to, to people, even in those days, used to talk to people about the Korean War. And they say, what war? Mm. What war? I didn't even know that there's a war going on in Korea. So What's what it? do you think that we have to do to teach about this? your honorable legacy as a Korean War veteran and pilot from South Africa for our young generation. How, what do you think we have to do? Well, in South Africa, you're not going to win. But in Korea, you've, you've, you've won over there. I mean, we were absolutely amazed at the young generation over there and even the, all the generations. But I was absolutely amazed at the young generation. I'm talking about these people that were carers, carers and other, or what have you, that we dealt with over there. I mean, and almost everybody uh, that, you, that you spoke to over there, the Koreans I'm talking about, uh, almost without fail, they all at one stage in your conversation, they all say to you in one, in one way or another, we thank you mm. for what, what you've done, mm. what you did for us during the war. Look, I've got a, I've got a friend... Uh, who trained in the South African Air Force, he, 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 as a matter of fact, he just died on, on Saturday in Vancouver. He, he finished up uh, 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 in living in Canada for many, many years now. And uh, uh, we went over, well, I, be, I went over to stay with him for a, couple, a few times. And he used to, he used to take, he used to wear a shirt, a long sleeve shirt like yours, but not with a tie, every day, change. And every week he used to take seven shirts to a laundry, a laundry run by a Korean guy mm -hmm. and his wife in Vancouver. And the one time, the first time that I was there, he t I went to this laundry with him the one day. And we walked into this laundry and he, and he used to, uh, uh, Bill, this friend of mine, used to call this Korean chap Ted because he couldn't pronounce his Korean name, so he used to call him Ted. And he said, and we walked in there and uh, he introduced me and then he said, he said, Ted, he said, I would here, fought in Korea. Ted looked at me. He just stood there and looked at me. He walked around the counter. He put out his hand and he said, thank you. 
and his wife, the same thing. Unbelievable. Mm. You know, and every time, every time now, whenever, well, I've really, he's, all right, he's, he, Bill's gone now, as I said, on Saturday, but uh, every time Bill used to we used to be in contact on email that regularly, a lot of the times, and whenever I went over there, I used to go into go and see, this, see them in, the, in their laundry, and we used to always, always say, look, Ted, okay, you know, it's Ted, okay, Ted, Ted says his, his regards, whatever to you. And, and this is the whole scene with the Koreans. You people have never forgotten. And I don't know if I could go commercial here a little bit. You, you could take it out if you like afterwards. I said to Dirk earlier on, uh, with the last uh, uh, four or five years, uh, Samsung, you obviously know about it, how they now pay for us that can't afford uh, medical aid. And I said to Dirk, without that medical aid, at this stage in, in our life, it wouldn't actually be worth living in South Africa. Mm. Because I couldn't afford private medical aid, uh, private hospitals, and the government, government hospitals, yeah, I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, so I've had my experience with them, and it's the last thing ever. I, I would never, sorry. So are you proud to be a Korean War veteran? I am. As I said to the people in Korea now, especially these young guys, I said to them, seeing what I see you people have done in Korea, I said, I know now that I never wasted my time. This is it. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm proud that I've been able to, in my own small way, to be able to enable what has happened in South Korea today. Not North Korea, I'm talking about South Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I'm proud that I was able, that I had something to do with that. Because it's, it's something that uh, I don't think has ever happened in this world before. Not that I can remember. You may know something about it. But I, I can't think of anything that's, uh, that's happened uh, anywhere near to what's happened in South Korea in the short period of time. I feel, like, I feel like you've been waiting for me to say this. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, and so I, I, can't, I can't think of any comparable scene that's ever, that's ever happened before. And also, I can never think of, and everybody else that, every, that you ever talk to here in South Africa, or what have you, about what goes on and how, uh, like this, this last trip now to Korea, last month, when you say, say to people, here, yeah, people that live here, when we say, okay, we were going to Korea, and the Korean government were paying, or the Ministry of Defense were paying for everything. Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, not Defense. Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs. Did they pay for it? Yeah, okay. MPVA. Okay, anyway, whoever paid for it, I said, you know, these people say, but, but why? You know, after 68 years, you know? And I said, but this is the Koreans. It's a different scene. They work on a different setup. They hold, they hold, Nation, their whole way of life is totally different to anybody that you can ever come across anywhere in the world. And they, they, they find it very really difficult to, 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 to believe this. But it shakes them, I tell you. When you, when, I, when you talk to people here in South Africa and you say, this is what the Koreans do, and after all these years, and they say, what? We can't believe it. It really, they, the people here cannot believe it. Mm -hmm. Great. Here, now your wife is with you. Could you introduce yourself? What is your name? I'm Patricia Eileen Holzhausen. Patricia. Yes. And the same last name, obviously. Yes. Yeah. When did you marry him? When did we get married? Oh, <laughs> you forgot? 2011. Oh, very recently. Yes. Wow. We both lost our previous partners. And we knew each other in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. or Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. And then, how did we get to know each other again? Through the um, newsletter, wasn't it? I yeah. Think we heard about each other losing our partners. I see. And uh, Patricia, did you know anything about Korea before you married to him? No, I didn't know anything about it. You didn't know about our great country? No, sadly. Oh, I didn't. come on. And I wish now I had, really, <laughs> I do. Because we so enjoyed our visit there, and I think you people are the greatest. But we're before, so... before you're talking about that, so you didn't know anything about Korea before you married to him? 
No, I didn't. I just knew there had been a war there, but that was about all. Did you know that he was Korean War veteran pilot from South Africa? Did you know that? No, only when I met up with him again and he told me about it. Hmm. I didn't know before. So you went to Korea with him last month? Yes. What did you find there? A fantastic <laughs> nation that was so hard working, it was unbelievable. And all so grateful to us. It was T beautiful to see. Tell me the detail. What, I mean, what did you see and what kind of people did you engage and how was it? Difficult to say. Um, our hostess for our group was a lovely woman and she couldn't do enough for us. And our young guide, what did you call him? Carer. Carer mm. was so caring for us. Make sure we never fell downstairs or anything. And it was just the whole time the Koreans were giving, giving, giving to us. And it was just so beautiful to see. It really was. How was the city that you saw? Was, how was the city? Big? Or? As Ivan said, very clean and beautiful. Mm. And we enjoyed it very much indeed. And they organized us on lovely bus trips out often. Mm -hmm. And everywhere we saw just looked so pleasant. It was really a delight for us to see. I wish so much that Africa could take away from Korea. How hard-working, lovely people you are. Mm. So, are you proud to be married to Korean War veteran? Very proud. Oh. Yes, very proud. I'm very thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. I wrote a little letter about our trip and sent it to all my friends because I was so proud of him. Mm. And the whole trip was just fantastic. So did you talk to your friends here in South Africa about your trip to Korea? Yes. And in, yes. And in, she's also got her brother and family in the in, uh, UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I've got my son in America. He, he was very keen to go. Uh, he possibly, maybe next year, he might even apply to, to go on a revisit. Oh. So, because he's very, very keen. I see. To go to see. He, was, yeah, he would like to have gone this time, but it was... That is, two of us could go. Mm -hmm. mm. So, tell me, it's going to be 70th anniversary by 2020. Do you have any special message to the Korean people and to Korea about your service, honorable service, during the Korean War? What would you say to Korean people? Well, all I could say, say to the Korean people is that... Uh, uh, looking back over the, over time now uh, to my service there, uh, I found that now that I certainly uh, was proud to have done it, and because of what you people have uh, achieved yeah, since yeah. 1953, it's a it's something that uh, unless one goes there and sees it and gets involved with the Korean people, uh, it's, you, you can't tell anybody, and because people don't, won't believe you, what, what you try and tell them. I mean, we found, talking about the people, uh, all the young people that we were involved with there, were uh, people, uh, like young people, that I can remember in South Africa when I was young. Uh, not like the young people in the West today. And when I'm West, I'm talking about not only here, other West countries too that I've been to. The, the young Korean people there were absolutely unbelievable. The older Korean people were absolutely unbelievable as well. They were absolutely super people. Uh, they, they, their whole outlook on life is, is so different to what, what happens here in Africa. Uh, you know, uh, Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, I'm not really proud to be a South African anymore. Uh, what's going on in Africa? It's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you, when you compare uh, life here to, to the life that you people lead over there and what you people think and, and what you, how, you, what, how you spend your lives over there, is so totally different mm. to, to what we do here in this country. I mean, 
can I say something? Yes, yes. I found that each person, whatever category it was, whether it was the woman who cleaned our rooms, or the people who showed us to a table every day, or served us, or our companion, or the hostess, were just lovely, lovely, caring people, and they did their jobs thoroughly right throughout. It was a real lesson to us. Mm. And it was very much to be admired. Yeah, well, I mean, they, yeah, they were just incredible people. <laughs> You know, we were able to do it, and we are proud of what we have achieved, but we were able to do it because all these UN forces, including you and many South African pilots and soldiers, came and defend us so that we can build our nation again. That mm. was the opportunity to given by you, and that's why we are doing this. We want to record your memory first of all, but at the same time, we're going to make it into teaching material so that teachers can talk about your war in Korea for our future younger generation. So on behalf of Korean nation, I want to thank you for your honorable service and fight. And thank you for your nice commendation of the Korean people. Patricia, My it was... Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much again. Thank okay. you so much for coming in. You know, uh, you know, I just want to put one, one more scene in here. Well, one day we went on, on, one morning we went on a visit. And when the bus arrived, we had a couple of parcels that had been given to us uh, by uh, Captain Shin and, uh, and his wife, and Lina. His wife, yeah. And we had these parcels and we took them with us out the bus. And uh, this, young, this young guy that, uh, that was our carer, he was he's around about 20 He's, in his last, he's going into his last year at varsity. Anyway, he uh, was waiting, he got out the bus, he was waiting at the bottom of the bus stairs for us to make sure we didn't fall or anything like that, had, and had a wheelchair ready there for, for us and what have you. And uh, we put the parcels down on the pavement. Now, the pavement was a wide pavement before we got in, and they were just going to push us off, but the parcels were there, I hadn't picked them up. And as he pushed us off, I said to him, whoa, I was, you know, can't leave the parcels there. He said to me, why, why not? I said, but they'll be stolen. He said, if we come back in three hours' time, they'll still be there. Mm. We were amazed. Mm. And I'm looking, looking at Seoul itself, driving through Seoul. Look, I looked at a lot of things because I wanted a comparison of what it was like life there is life here. And I looked at a lot of things there and compared traffic, uh, all these things. I, I looked at this whole lot. Mm -hmm. And I looked at uh, the uh, uh, sort of Excuse potential me, crime tissue. rate. Can I go and get a tissue, please? Mm. And, Sorry. Sure. And uh, uh, I spoke to these guys about, uh, about uh, crime rate. There, obviously, there is crime. There's, no, there's nowhere in the world there's no crime. But look at uh, shops and all these sort of things there. Uh, people uh, leave stuff out at night and what have you. And the next morning it's still there. I mean, you can't do that in, in Africa. Mm. Uh, and uh, otherwise it's gone. It's as quick as that. It's just all gone. Right. Yeah. And uh, this, is a, this is the whole scene mm. where, uh, you know, the, the whole ethics of, of people are so different. Where I... I I thank you for your very wonderful compliments for the people and the Korean society. And I think uh, that's the kind of characteristics that made us possible to achieve what we've been doing. But again, on behalf of Korean nation, I want to thank you for your honorable service and being supportive of Korean people. Thank you so much again. It was it was great, I could tell you. That, uh, well, I, I, as I say, <laughs> when you talk to people here in South Africa, they, they just can't believe it. Mm. They can't believe it. You made, you made us possible to do so. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I'm proud of you. Well, <laughs> uh, well I'm, I'm glad that I achieved something in my life that, that was worthwhile. Because it is worthwhile. Look at Korea, that's for sure. Excellent. Thank you.